Hey everyone, today we are looking at the meat industry and some basic terminology before we get into our beef retail cuts. So we're going to be looking at beef, pork, and lamb. Um, we're going to start with beef because the most cuts come from beef, just a larger animal has larger and more cuts. Then we will look at pork and then we'll follow with lamb. Lamb has only a few cuts, so it'll get easier as we go through. But let's first look at what you guys said in class the other day. I had you take and look at what the media industry looked like between 1880 and 1900s, kind of in that realm, then in the 50s to 60s, and then 90s to 2000s, and then today. So to kind of summarize what you probably have on your sheet of paper or your poster, um, when we are looking at the 1800s, 1900s, um, we're looking at refrigerated rail cars, hanging meat. It was very laborsome. Um, they would do cure pumping, butcher lines to disassemble. It was very unsanitary. It just wasn't the safest um, work conditions. Um, you likely would not have been in school unless your family was wealthy. At the age of 14, 15, when you were in eighth grade, you would have then left school and gone to work, some even younger than that. And they would work right alongside the adults in the factories. Um, not a lot of safety regulations, though inspections did start around that time. Um, it, one of the big changes that came in the meat industry was 13 pages in a book called The Jungle. And The Jungle was written by Upton Sinclair, and I believe it was like 1903, 1906, somewhere in that realm. And those 13 pages, while they were only a small portion of the book, revolutionized factories and especially the meat industry. People realized that um, the conditions were just gross. For instance, if a rat was running by in the factory, just the fact that it was in the factory is gross. But if it ran by and it happened to fall into the vat of meat that was being ground up into ground beef, it would get ground up with it. And nobody stopped and said, hey, this is gross. Um, if somebody caught their hand in it and part of it went into the grinder, it was just meat. They would say, wrap it up and send them home, maybe to the doctor if there was one available. Um, the shavings on the floor, they would use sawdust to um, suck up the blood, soak up the blood. So you just had this sawdust that was kind of like rotting on the floor with the blood in it. Sometimes that would even get mixed in. Um, it was just pretty gross. Temperature wasn't kept good. And that's when the public, when they read this book, said, whoa, Nellie, we're not going to deal with that. And um, they actually revolutionized. And that's when your um, members of Congress went to work at making stricter policies when it came to meat production. In the 50s and 60s, we saw that consumers were concerned. People wanted to know where their food was coming from. It became more of an um, interest. It wasn't just going to the grocery store and getting what's there. Also, it was you didn't just go to a butcher shop. There were still butcher shops out there, but you're starting to see more technology, more refrigeration. We started to have TV dinners, which now we think about as like microwave meals. Um, but back then, TV dinners still went into the oven, but it was something that was conveniently packed and it was already there. And that really changed a lot of things, how we produce things, the demand on food too, because more people wanted those small specialty goods. Uh, more meat scientists um, to study it, more grocers. Um, we're going to increase safety and cleanliness, mass production, just growing and growing, more machinery and equipment. It was not as hard as hard of a job. Um, and I already mentioned convenience food, more regulations, and small shops were still there. For instance, I can remember when I was very, very small, we had a butcher shop here in town. Um, and I was not born in the 50s and 60s. Let me throw that in there. But I can remember up into the, um, I was born in 81. So in the 80s, that we have still had a butcher shop in town. So what does it look like now? The present times, it's very sanitary. Um, they take temperature checks throughout the process. Um, they inspect the meat when it comes in. When it's a live animal, they inspect it after the kill and the hide's been removed. If anything is off, it gets out. If they find a hair in it, it gets shut down, cleaned, and they throw out that meat. Lots of computers and technology. Um, we just see more and more convenience products. We see organic, natural, grass-fed, free-range labels like that. Um, regulations just out the wazoo. They just keep growing. Um, by local movements, low-carb diets, putting more need for meats and um, protein um, sources. Uh, Non-meat diets, so alternatives to meat where it may still look like meat, such as the Incredible Burger, um, being that it is a plant-based burger. 
So um, new trade where we're sending it overseas. Um, we have lots of new breeds, just increased production. Of course, COVID now we can also say has hit um, our meat industry. And it really, like a bunch of the plants shut down during COVID due to high COVID numbers, um, people testing positive. And so then it kind of became a backup and we had the meat shortages during our quarantines and shutdowns. Um, those packers are still backed up trying to get animals butchered. And of course, if they're shut down and you can't butcher them, then we have a lot of animals that go to waste. So um, there's a lot of interesting things going on in today's present meat industry world. So what's it going to look like when your grandkids are your age? So we're looking like 2056, 2057, somewhere in there. Um, what's it, what do you think it's going to be? So I already have the, you guys doing this, so you can skip that one. But some of the things that we might consider and some of your activity, your responses to that activity are that it's all automated. Um, sanitary, cleaner, fewer injuries, meat costs going to be more expensive. Um, livestock numbers going down, um, you know, how like people eating more grain. So now that we've used our crystal ball to look into the future, let's look at some vocab and some processes in the meat production um, in the United States now and in the past. So first of all, we look at some major legislation. Um, meat Inspection Act of 1906 was really the turning point. Before that, there was no inspection of the meats prior to butchering, during butchering, etc. So um, then that book, The Jungle, came out that I discussed earlier, and it really revolutionized everything. So the 1906 um, legislation was passed very quickly that, hey, we have to start inspecting. Um, so now there's even more. Um, I just put on some of these that were kind of the starters, the kickstarters or major um, turning points. But in 1906, that act said, hey, we need to start inspecting these animals whenever they're being butchered, like the ones coming in when they're alive. Now they're inspected when they get there. The whole inspection process is watched and monitored by a USDA inspector. And then um, the, the meat is inspected post processing as well. So it is very highly regulated and it is a rarity that we see something get through the process and into the meat product and to the consumer. Then we have the Poultry Inspection Act of 1957, the Interstate Foreign Commerce Act, which is basically monitoring trade between states um, once you cross state lines, and then COOL, which stands for Country of Origin Labeling, which began in the early 2000s. Um, this is one that's been repealed and then parts of it have come back. Basically, it's saying that we need to label where our food is coming from. Just like you can look in the, your tag of your t-shirt and see where it's from, where it was made. Well, we want to know where is our meat products coming from and really any food products. Um, and I don't think I said this, but there is a sheet that you can follow along and put some notes on from the what we're talking about here. Um, it is attached to the same assignment in Google Classroom. So what does it mean to be organic? Organic is a word that's thrown around a lot these days. Um, sometimes it's kind of a trend. Sometimes it's um, choices made because for health purposes. But organic in beef or in animals means something a little different than it does in plants. Um, same basis, but a little different. We also see some words like grass-fed, free-range, hormone-free. Well, organic basically means that it is... Um, fed, that animal is fed grains that are only organically grown. That means no pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers put on them. And that animal, if it were to eat one bite of something that was a treated grain, then it is going to get um, pulled out and it would not be allowed to be organic. Um, also, that animal is not going to receive any antibiotics or hormones, but a little bit with that. I said there was a hormone free or no antibiotics you see on different items. Um, antibiotics are just for animals are just like they are for you and I. Um, if we take a medicine, it has a has time to run its course in our body and then it is gone from our body once it runs its course um, and we have basically a withdrawal period afterwards then it's not going to show up in our body anymore it's kind of like professional athletes who are tested for drugs um, and it could be something like 
Benadryl for allergies or something for the common cold like DayQuil, and it might have a banned substance in it. If that shows up in their drug report, um, their test, then they can actually get disqualified from their competition. So then they can't run, or if they already um, won that, then they have to forfeit their winnings. Well, if they, that doesn't mean that they can never take that medicine. It just means that they can't take it so close to the race. So it may be um, that you can't take it four days before the race because after four days, it will be out of your body. It's the same way for animals. If you give them antibiotics to treat an illness um, and try to make them better and alleviate their pain, it's going to have a withdrawal period. And it might be one day or one week. It might be two weeks. Well, you can't send them for butcher before it has run its course and the withdrawal period is over. At that point, it's not going to show up and it's not going to affect anyone that consumes that meat. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to hide it. It's the fact that it is actually out of their system. And you, as somebody who's eating that steak, is not going to have any of those ramifications. As far as hormones go, we'll talk about it a little more later. But the amount of hormones that are given if they do inject hormones into the animal, the amount of hormones that are given is so small that it is less than what a female animal produces um, in her body. It's less than what some vegetables have naturally. So I have a little video clip that I would like for you to click on below. Um, and so pause this one and then play that one. It's a YouTube clip on kosher and um, then kind of explain that on your paper. Okay, now that we're back and you've looked at kosher, kind of see what goes into that. You may have seen that on different meats um, at the grocery store. Um, a lot of times in the deli counter, especially when we look at hot dogs um, and other sausages, what can be kosher? Um, I forgot I had mentioned grass-fed and free-range whenever it went to animals on that last slide before the video. Um, free-range means that they are not caged. So a lot of times we hear that with chickens or other birds. Basically, that means that they can hunt and scratch in the yard and um, be fed that way. Um, your, I forget what the other one, oh, grass-fed. Grass-fed, a lot of times um, we hear in cattle and grass-fed is when the animal is not given any grain. It is only going to graze and it might have some hay. Um, and that works. You can grow them. It's going to be a slower rate. That's why we give them corn. As you saw when we did our Pearson Square, you're giving them high protein in the, the combinations of um, grain and feed that we're giving. So it gets them to market faster. So it costs more to do grass fed. So it's usually more expensive at the store. And that animal is going to be older whenever it gets butchered by a few months, if not a little longer. So it's usually a slightly tougher meat. Um, so it, you kind of have to use personal preference as to which you like, but most of the current time, like I mentioned with the antibiotics and the hormones, the grain is going to be totally fine for that animal to consume. Okay, moving on. So beef, pork, and lamb, what does it come from? So beef um, is beef and veal that comes from cattle. Pork, ham, and bacon come from pigs. Um, bacon is a cut and ham is a cut in the animal. Lamb and mutton come from sheep. And lamb is anything that is butchered under two years of age. So when that animal was two years or younger, they're going to be considered lamb. And at two year, over two years of age, they are going to be considered mutton. Um, there is a difference in flavor, but otherwise it's the same animal. Okay, on your device or using your device, I want you to look up and figure out how much of each of those beef, pork, and lamb does the United States produce every year? And then how much of it does the U.S. consume every year? So how much do we produce and actually make to sell? And then how much do we um, actually eat? Okay, you can put that on your um, worksheet and we'll keep rolling. So some diseases that affect the the meat industry or animal industry. We have BSE. Um, these are some of the common ones that have happened in the last 20 years, but there's others out there. So BSE is um, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. That is known as BSE. It's also known by the media as mad cow disease. So this is a 
disease that affects the nervous system and the brain, um, which I guess is part of the nervous system. And it causes the animal to lose control. It basically um, eats away at the brain and they lose control of their functions. They stumble um, around, they don't eat, and they eventually end up dying. Um, usually they are euthanized to put them out of their misery and to hopes to stop the spread. Humans can contract these, um, most of these on here. So it is a concern. Um, it has gone, I, I don't want to say gone away, but it has um, definitely dropped in numbers. We rarely hear of it right now, but in the early 2000s, this was very prevalent. Also, at the same time, in the early 2000s, though it's been around forever, we heard a lot of hoof and mouth. Now, in humans, there is something called foot and mouth, and it's very similar. It's going to have the same problems. You're going to have sores, lesions on your feet and legs, and also on your arm or your mouth. Um, and you're not going to want to eat. It's kind of like having just sores inside of your mouth. And so the same thing to those animals. And basically, again, the best or there's not really a major treatment. You can do preventative measures, but um, once they get it, you pretty much have to euthanize the animal to get rid of it. Salmonella and E. coli are natural um, pathogens that are on and in our meats. So salmonella is on chickens and any bird meat, and it actually lives within the muscle. And this is why we have to go ahead and cook our chicken full through. It shouldn't have any pink in it. E. coli lives on the outside of the muscle. And we hear that a lot in our beef, pork, lamb. Um, but E. coli can come from lots of things. Um, if you don't wash your hands well after going to the bathroom, you can spread E. coli. Um, e. coli on those animals is naturally on the outside of the muscles. So like a steak, if you like your steak rare, like I do, it's safe because the bacteria is not inside the muscle. It's only on the surfaces that were touched with the blade of the knife or with um, laying on your cutting board. So it's important to sear the outsides of those and then the inside is still untainted. Um, we have swine flu. There's actually two different ones. Right now we have African swine fever, but previously we had swine flu that killed out lots of um, hogs. We had bird flu, um, which I don't know why it says blue, but bird flu is what we're looking at, and that affected birds. Um, it was very large in Asia many years ago. And then right now we have African swine fever, which is a major concern for the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, right now, I have not heard recently if we've had any confirmed cases, but it is sweeping through. China is the number one pork producer in the, the entire world, and we're talking major pork producer, like out produced us by far. And they have killed at least 90% of their hogs now. Um, they have euthanized them because it has spread so quickly and so rapidly. Um, so U.S. officials are very worried. Um, they basically are saying it's not if it will get to the U.S., it's when it will get to the U.S. And once it hits, we're going to be in trouble as far as our pork production, because we definitely don't want to have to euthanize a bunch of animals. That's a lot of money losses. And it means that the supply is going to go down. So right now you can go to the grocery store and you can usually find pork to be pretty affordable. However, once swine flu hits, that's going to all change. And so obviously we don't want to hit people in the pocketbooks like that. Um, we want pork to be available. So then we're going to look at some preventative measures. What are some things that pork producers, or not pork producers, but meat um, production, what do they do to help prevent these issues from arising? So I'm going to go ahead and have you click on the link below. It should be the um, other link that is on there. It has a lady talking in a poultry plant uh, just because my internet is not allowing me to play it on here. So go ahead and hit pause on this one and play the other video. All right, now that you've looked at it, you've kind of seen what are some of the things that they do to take precautions. So we're going to run through a little bit of terminology. Again, this is on your worksheet for you to be able to look at. So class, when we are putting our, we're basically grading our meats, we're looking and putting them into classes. Classes are very similar to like you have classes here at school. Um, they are grouped by the carcass. Um, or the carcass and meats by the kind of animal and what you're going to use it for. So beef goes into beef classes, pork into pork classes. And because they are different, they're going to have some different names, though some of them are kind of similar. So um, then we have grade. And just like you are in a 
grade, a grade level, then it's part of the class that you have to meet these certain characteristics. So like you, if you are a freshman, you are a freshman because of your age, the number of years you have completed in school and your level of um, proficiency. In animals, it's kind of like that as well. So it's part of a class, you fit these characteristics and grading is just that into a verb. So it's just what you can do. Uh, quality and palatability, that is your flavor. So quality is based on palatability and palatability is how flavorful the meat is. And you can actually tell that by um, looking at it. And it has to do with marbling in the meats. So what is marbling? Well, marbling is the good fat. And I think I have a picture. So when we look at this picture, you can see that the top steak, it has that fat on the outside of it. Okay, that big white strip of fat on the left side of that picture. That is called subcutaneous fat. So right here, the second bullet down, it says, what's subcutaneous fat? That is the fat that sits underneath the skin that cushions it. So basically, if you run into a table or into a wall or you get poked or something, it keeps your skin from bruising. Well, you might bruise, but it doesn't damage the muscle. Then we have intermuscular fat, I-N-T-E-R. That is what's between muscles. So muscle to muscle, it cushions it so that um, those muscles don't injure each other as you are moving. And then we have intramuscular, I-N-T-R-A. Intramuscular is the fat within the muscle. So just like this picture, it is what gives it flavor. So you can see that bottom right, um, it has hardly any white inside the red muscle. Well, that means that that one's going to be tougher and it's going to be less flavorful. So prime, as the top one shows, USDA Prime, that's the highest level of grading and that's the best of the best. Choice is second. You can see it still has some of that white flex of fat in there, but definitely not as much. And then we have select, which is kind of middle of the road. You can still eat it as a steak. It's still good. It's not one of those that you're like, yeah, I'll never eat that because it wasn't good. Um, but it's just not quite up there at the top. You're not going to have quite as much flavor. All right, we're going to stop there for today and we'll pick up with the rest on Friday. Have a fantastic day and I